I'm talking today about artificial intelligence, in short, AI, as many of you know. I went uh, onto a research, of course, before and looked through the TED Talks, and I got really depressed. I think we have to talk about the positive aspects. AI is not only out to kill us, so I'll try to first depress you a little bit and then build you up again. So let's do a recap. Uh, what happened recently? AI has been pushing the boundaries and has been killing it, as you say, um, in the last few years. It has beaten us in every tactical game. I'm talking about chess, checkers, go tournaments. Um, I think StarCraft, we are still good, but other than that, we are pretty beaten. Uh, it is helping us in medical research. And the next cool thing is it's driving us home when we are too drunk to drive ourselves. So. While machines are becoming more and more part of our life, um, they bring great challenges to us. And one of these challenges that I'm talking about today is jobs. One of the um, big questions we have to ask is how long will we be able to, to follow the jobs that we are currently conducting? Half of us in here, our friends, our families, will not be able to work in the same field they are working in right now. They will lose their jobs to computation within the next decades. So let's take a deeper look. Um, a study by the Oxford Martin School revealed that uh, we could cluster our jobs that we currently have in three categories. Low risk to be replaced by computation in the next decades, medium risk and high risk, where you can see that 47% of all the jobs lie in. Now, while uh, we will be working longer in areas like healthcare, for example, transportation, production, or um, administrative jobs in the business fields, etc., will have a very hard time in the next few years. And this is not just a theory. This is happening right now as I'm speaking. Let's look into transportation for a second. So I guess everyone has heard about uh, self-driving cars, and we are all uh, crazy about it and looking forward to being consumers of this whole new technology. But there is a different area that is also uh, in this field, which is the trucking area. One in 15 people that are working in the US are truckers or affiliated to trucking. Now, of course, there are cool implications of bringing uh, trucking and self-driving trucks into the fields. For example, they never get tired. They can drive between Munich and Vienna forever without ever complaining. They cannot form unions. So, of course, it makes sense from a business standpoint, but think about 8.7 million people being replaced in this area. Huge problem. And this is a really scary thought, right? That one day you will not only comp uh, compete against other humans, but you will also compete against machines that are built to replace you on the market, like a crazy Terminator hunting you down and replacing every field you're trying to work in. As you can see, this TED talk could derail now into a really depressing part, but this is not what I'm here to talk about. I want to present you with a complete different view on AI. I want to take you down to a path in which we merge with technology and become superhumans within our lifetimes. A world in which artificial intelligence is amplifying our brains. There's a word for it. It's called intelligence amplification. It's um, to make my case that we can coexist with AI. I want to present you today with two ideas. And if you believe me those two ideas, we might both see the same vision. One, machines need us more than we think. So everything you heard about AI, uh, that these things will become the next Terminator or something, is not inherently true. And the second one, is that we need AI to make our work more exciting than ever. If we accept that we need each other in this life, we will both profit from it. So bear with me. Let's see if I can convince you. Let's start with number one. Machines need us. Well, they definitely don't need us to drive a car, apparently, but uh, they also have limitations. And to show you the limitations of today's machines, uh, I want to compare um, a modern computer to a fruit fly. So let's take this fruit fly. Um, it has the brain of the size of a grain of sand. It has around 100,000 neurons. And I'm pretty sure it's really bad at calculus, for example. 
as far as I know, maybe they are amazing and just weren't able to communicate about it. Um, it cannot search a billion web pages and translate them from English into Spanish into German. Definitely not. And it cannot conduct a semantic search through our emails and find every email about oranges. I guess that would be the equivalent to porn for fruit flies. Um, that's what they can't do. But it can navigate in complete new terrain. You can let out a fruit fly, it will find some food, no matter how good you hide it. It can find a mate to procreate with, which is magical in the natural world. Even some humans struggle with that part. And it can land upside down on the ceiling, which is something so mesmerizing and amazing, and most machines fail with it. Now, we could constantly stare up there and look at the fruit fly in awe if we are not out to kill it right now because somebody left the oranges out. But um, I think this really gives you an idea of how far ahead certain parts of our, our brains are. If we, with our computation powers, cannot replicate the functionality and the brain of a fruit fly, don't even get me started how far away machines are in terms of replicating a human brain. So let's talk about the human brain for a second. We are really good at a few things. One really amazing one is we can create new rules and understand new patterns where there haven't been any before. We can, you can throw a hundred thousand informational bits at us and we'll find the important ones for us in a second. We can do complex tasks in a 3D environment. Remember, landing upside the, the ceiling wouldn't be one that us humans could do, but if you watch the Olympics, for example, we are capable of some pretty awesome stuff. And we can understand socially complex situations. No machine yet has properly passed the Turing test, right? So uh, they aren't really capable yet of even showing a social capability that we are trying to create. If we want to get the most out of AI in our lifetime, maybe we should stop thinking about building robots like an iRobot or something, or like in, in Terminator. Maybe we should understand that we have another possibility of understanding the limitations of computation, taking our artificial friends by the hand, and let them do what they do best, which is a lot of similar stuff in a very short time. Yeah, so this is the part why machines really need us, in our lifetime at least. Let's talk about the question why we do need machines as well. So uh, everything started, I guess, when we climbed down from the trees and on top of the food chain. Um, we built societies and cities, and this uh, raised our demand for certain things in bulk to, to a new level. So every one of us had to become really specialized in what they did, meaning that we are now have a very weird concept of labor, right? So I'm pretty sure everyone does sometimes really exciting stuff at work, but 80% might be pretty repetitive, right? And this is a concept uh, that our brain was not made to, to follow and to be. What is our brain made to be? Well, Let's jump into the classic neurologic image of the left and the right brain hemispheres. Just bear in mind, this is popular science, or however you call it, this is completely antiquated. So don't take this, as the, um, take this with a grain of salt. This is more for the metaphorical part. The left one in the theory of neurology, uh, of the ancient classic neurology, was in charge of logic understanding facts, reciting facts, and uh, processing language, for example, and speaking, as I do right now. The right side, on the other hand, was built for creativity, imagination, context. So while the left side understands the sentence, the right side might understand the tone or where you're coming from and the nuances of it. But which of these two sides would be in charge if you were to file your tax report? or if you had to work through 100,000 spreadsheets during the year, or doing your time tracking, 
or I don't know, do the calculations after this TED event and so on, uh, or helping me with finding proper image for my talk. These are bulk jobs and both of our hemispheres are basically too good for it. I would like to introduce a third hemisphere. In this theory, we have another brain half that is attached to our two brains and is in charge of repetition, accuracy and speed, something machines are amazing at. Imagine a world in which you have this third hemisphere and you can throw it through your tasks like a boomerang. So it's like, okay, I have to do time tracking, whoosh. And as you uh, see the boomerang go through these tasks, through these dull and, uh, dull and bulk tasks, your left brain uh, assigns new tasks and your right brain thinks about the next cool thing you could do. Intelligence amplification is our chance to be human again and to avoid becoming machines at our workplace. But there's also a second reason why we need machines in the future. Next to repetition, machines can also create a new way of fidelity at work. The beauty of being humans is that we are not alone with the co complex minds that we have. Everyone in here is different. So this variety of each encounter is what makes life, especially social life, so beautiful. But it also means that every mind works differently. And there is a lot of ambiguity in communication. You know that uh, sometimes when you talk to people, there is some impreciseness or downright sarcasm that you don't understand. And a minute later, there is a huge fight, a misunderstanding, frustration, or historically speaking, maybe even war arising from the different minds that we have. In my job, I help large enterprises to make sense of the communication of their workers by understanding natural language within the companies. We know that in a company of 15,000 people, we have 15,000 different nuances in assigning a task to each other. Some people are more extroverted, some are more introverted, some people formulate everything in a sarcastic statement and walk out of the door, but you still have to somehow align everyone. And this is where machines can become a new kind of mediator that gets trained for each person to understand the way they communicate and then translate it into a list of tasks that makes it possible for those 15,000 people to find a common ground. With this mediation, we can ensure that you, you understand what your counterpart expects from you. And this is why machines can make our work life more awesome. So how can we connect with AI today? Well, the first one is the one I just mentioned, natural language processing. This means that the machine, think about Siri, listens to you or reads what you've been uh, writing and tries to add some intelligence to it to make it easier. The second one is a behavior-based interface where the machine connects with every device you have and tries to learn about you to make your life more easy, like uh, order some coffee when you're out of coffee and so on, or some oranges when they run bad due to fruit fly infestation. Um, the third one is augmented reality. Uh, this is one that has been all the rage recently, right? A machine improves your visual field by seeing what you see and gives you the information that you currently need while talking. Would be awesome for me to look at the slides while looking at you. And uh, the fourth one would be the brain-computer interface. And this is the Olymp that we want to get up to. So the moment we are able to have a real brain-computer interface, a frictionless, will be the moment where we have access to this third hemisphere and can directly outsource every bulk task that we have to a machine. A machine can do these tasks better, and with uh, BCI, we will be able to finally get to this new way of relaxation at work. So, some of you might have heard this uh, beautiful Jurassic Park quote, Change is often scary and exciting at the same time. And not everyone benefits equally from technological change. There is no doubt that some jobs will not be replaced, but will be gone forever. But maybe 
and that's my hope, maybe we can supercharge the brains of everyone so that they can easily, easily switch between different professions, right? So if the trucker that loses his job is able to connect, for example, to this uh, intelligence amplification, maybe he will be able to get a foothold in the next challenge that he looks into in his career. This is also a field where retraining has been a lot less successful, and I hope that we will get there in time. As we create technology, we have to give meaning to it as we go. Mine is to create a world in uh, which intelligence amplification makes space for our brain to reach its true potential. Let's work together on a future in which we escape the hamster wheels of our cubicles and be the creative, sarcastic wonders that we are. Thank you.